Good morning to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today. Alan Clements here from Santa Monica, California, United States. May 28th, 2021. Uh, today's talk, uh, a continuation of all the talks, especially yesterday, Life is Meditation, a favorite topic of mine and a challenging subtitle on becoming unblinded. I know it's a, a bold and somewhat daring declaration, uh, but let's dive into the experiential intelligence, if you will, to illuminate with greater radiance the quality of seeing. I know that we have our eyes open and among us there are those who are not blinded physically. Uh, but so much of life as I can see it to this extent is the courage to increase, if you will, the pixelation of of presence. Presence is the function for me of seeing and feeling and knowing, transforming, engaging, uh, relaxing primordial attachments and fears, and equally exciting and developing those primordial uh, transformational energies of of wisdom, and especially of freedom. And so much of it's connected to this, this function, this cognitive function through the eye and through the ear, the mouth, the body, the tongue, the mind, uh, essentially the three avenues of existence and perception, body and mind, and thought, speech and action through the six senses. Is, is so intimately connected to how well we perceive, how well we see. And so by way of saying, let's, let's, talk, about, let's, let's talk about becoming more aware, increasing our capacity to see and overcoming <clears throat> unblindedness. Uh, a little bit unsteady today. It was an extremely long night of long meditation. I don't know why I was so awake. There's a lot of energy, a lot of feeling, a lot of emotion. Uh, for those of you who were tuning in for the first time, uh, just in short, I've been diagnosed uh, as of April 11th with what's known as an acutely enlarged ascending aorta aneurysm, which I knew nothing about, nor did I know even the language that I just used until April 11th. The largest artery in the body coming out of the heart, going to the neck in the brain, uh, is uh, extremely enlarged and is in the immediate vicinity, I'm told by, several leading surgeons here in the Los Angeles area, that it is uh, a ticking bomb uh, ready to explode, burst, or rupture, or dissect is the language they use. Um, so there's this heightened immediacy and urgency in my life. And last night, uh, I was quite awake, and uh, as a practice, I, I have removed as much as possible the idea of going to bed to sleep and replaced it with this heroic attempt to, to meditate throughout the night. And of course, uh, I do fall asleep and equally I engage my mind and my body. Last night I put my hands on my heart and physically felt the heartbeat 
and then deeply entered body and deeply entered the heart and began to visualize a deeper sense of seeing and equally an overcoming of a type of denial or compartmentalization that could easily be synonymous with a type of deliberate or willful avoidance or blindedness. And I chose to unmask, take my so-called denial sunglasses off and truly feel, feel both the diagnosis, the prognosis, and the existential uh, reality of being embodied, being cognitively encased in a body, and the obvious of, of these inexplicable trillions of causal conditions simultaneously interrelating within our bodies, in our minds, the biological intelligence, that form of, of, of anatomical ecosystem of, of the veins and the blood and the heart and the lungs, the liver, the pancreas. For me, I don't know about you, but often goes unnoticed, unfelt, unseen, unappreciated. Yes, nutrition, diet, exercise, but to truly, as I was attempting last night, to inhabit with, I want to say, heart wide open, <laughs> eyes, eyes wide open in the midst of the night. The nights are long when you're not sleeping. And so I tried to take something wrong out of the space. I really, Alan, removed the narrative and the propaganda of something wrong is happening. And so I felt my heart I felt its, its naturalness, I felt its intelligence, I felt its gifted function to animate the blood throughout my body, to allow me to even be in present time, presence with physicality, with the body, the blood, the lungs. And, and something I often do, just to take as much as possible, the idea of practice in the future, the idea of practice and the, the idea of the future out of the space. It's not practicing dying or living, it's just the immediacy of, of the experience of being with the function of seeing, feeling, and occupying the seeing and feeling with as much clarity as possible, not just to see, but what is it that I am seeing? What is it that I am intuitively learning um, in the process of becoming unblinded removing the filter of denial, compartmentalization, uh, the idea of practice or training, or the idea of getting through the night, or the idea of healing. And I began to feel the, the immense immediacy of what had been told to me by these surgeons and by the testing in the hospitals to indicate this, this, as they call it, super enlarged aorta aneurysm. And I began to hear how I remember their words, the, you will die, uh, it's urgent, it's immediate. And I couldn't help but feel the naturalness of vulnerability in those thoughts. Um, I began to think of and feel the, the, the pure frailty of 
how existence, how my body, my mind, your body, my mind, your life, our lives, the earth, the, the immense frailty of so many interrelated conditions simultaneously kind of orchestrating in some, some level of discernible intelligence, but an immensity of unrecognizable intelligences. And there was a part of me that wanted to, I wanted it not to be real. I think the fear of death, the fear of discontinuity, comes not from the fear of losing my own capacity to be, but it's losing the capacity to be in relationship with the people you live for, the people that you adore, the people that are so everything. It's like, the, and so I began to feel into eyes that were occupying the South African concept of Ubuntu. I cannot be who I am without you. And it's so easy for me to use the word, not glibly, my life isn't glib, but everything becomes a, a, a more immediate, more intimate, more awakened, more vulnerability, more a sightfulness, if there's a word, sightfulness. And an insightfulness is not always easy to, to breathe. And this frailty, this, this sense of, gosh, discontinuity, you, go, you no longer can just entertain the, the buffering of reality with being healthy. You are decidedly now with a, a diagnosed fatal illness unless you have it surgically repaired. And, and I'm thinking, wow, and th would the fear of discontinuity go away with surgery? No. Would it give me hope for a better tomorrow? Not really. Gives you more time with loved ones and to meet new loved ones. A little bit of a spark of that's kind of cool, but what if they were suffering? What if they were the men and women being tortured in a gulag in Burma? The horror of that. And I'm seeing how intimately I deny concentric depths, if you will, of reality. And discontinuity means one thing, and then discontinuity means something very deeper as we feel more into this, this immeasurable, continuous discontinuity. <laughs> and I'm, I hope I'm making some sense to you in this free-flowing sharing And it was no relief to think that surgery inspired hope or it didn't seem to have anything to do with touching that more primordial, I want to say naturally arising fear, conditioned fear of discontinuity or death or separation from loved ones or I remember thinking in my own mind's eye last night and knowing so many people whom have passed away and the ways in which 
they have passed on. Even my mom, primarily in a wheelchair for so long and incontinent, my dad, an amazing, heartfelt husband, bathing her, cleaning her, cooking for her, tending to her. My mom in an assisted living home, being cared for by my beloved brother and his wife, tubed up, taken care of now by sister-in-law and brother and nurses and doctors. And it, what I'm thinking, like, what is the fear here about? So I was playing with this meditative thing, life as meditation, the little things in the whole, and the process of becoming unblinded and pulling back the veil of cultural, spiritual, political, relationship, existential narrative slash propaganda. And this, the blinding, it was like I became so alert last night, the blinding reality that everything is graded on life and death in the moment and immeasurable uncertainty, every condition out from the moment in my own chest, the, the aneurysm, the diagnoses of it rupturing is really just a, analogous to everything, everywhere. It's not a pessimistic evaluation. It's, it's just another way of looking at the faces of dukkha, the Buddhist Pali word for that which you can't control and that is not reflective of self. Therefore, is unsatisfying, unsatisfactory. And to see really what I was looking at last night in my meditation was becoming unblinded to dukkha. It wasn't the heart, it wasn't the aneurysm, it wasn't aging, it wasn't death. It was just this miraculous terror of causal conditions in this infinite tapestry of interrelated phenomena. I tried to find myself in there that was the narrator or the recipient or the subject of this endless perception of discontinuity and it, the familiarity of my thoughts, my thoughts, the familiarity of conditioned types of thoughts. I'm pointing here to, again, life is meditation, not sitting and watching the breath alone, but occupying the phenomenology of interiority as its natural function, as intimately and as realistically as possible in all postures throughout the day at all times, in all context, all degrees of challenge and crises, through thought, speech, and action, through the six senses, outside and inside, simultaneously at the confluence of inner and outer. That level of, of, of satipatthana, vipassana, mindful intelligence, the holism of a, of a of a willingness to feel reality as it really is, really is, the unblindedness to reality and the ways in which we refract and distort reality through conditioned 
narratives and emotions and to study the function of those narratives and emotions to see them as they really are, to understand their manifestation, their characteristic. This is the power, you know, of vipassana, insight meditation, to see the reality of something, to know the reality of something, to act on the reality of something. That those three dimensions that lead to wisdom and freedom from unreality, freedom from distortions. And it's one of the greatest kept obvious secrets in the world is how pervasive the dukkha is out here, in, in here. It's unimaginable to reflect upon the friends and families and relatives of the billions of homo sapiens that have lived from time immemorial, each of them, some celebrating the death of others and some weeping and mourning for their entire lifetime, that convulsion of discontinuity. But it virtually passes unnoticed. And last night meditating, my, the aneurysm was just simply a symbol, a reflection, an insight into discontinuity. There was nothing wrong with it. It was just naturally living in conditionality with its natural functioning. And my relationship, my attitude, my fears, my hopes, my dreams, surgery, non-surgery, all were just kind of the, the, the narratives that go on, often unnoticed. But last night in the silence of a long night, in this, this diagnosis of imminent death without surgery, I didn't feel that there was a way out. I don't know about you, but going from one home to the other, even, even the concept of mindful euthanasia, it's not a way out. It's just saying that the house that we're in is no longer habitable in the consciousness that I know myself to be. Thinking that the suffering that I'm engaged in physical, mental, emotional, existential, can be remedied through purposeful discontinuity, engaged discontinuity, the, the physical, biological, existential euthanasia. But it's really not permanent non-perception. This, this incessant causality, the river of causality with currents of karma and the result of karma, the convulsions on the river, birth, aging, death, war, famine, asteroids, dinosaurs, birth, aneurysms, Dengue fever, malaria, COVID, bioweapons, vaccinations, propaganda, the convulsions I was thinking last night and feeling last night. I was watching my breath, watching my heart, and such a big part of me just wanted it to go away, you know, just. Go, go away, aneurysm. Give me health. Give me a few more years. And I said, no. T see the propaganda of fear here, Alan. You're a meditator. You're a yogi. Enter this fear and 
and deconsolidate it with your mindfulness. Actively engage it and increase its increase the visibility of its of it of it realistically with wisdom. Become unblinded through wisdom. The courage to see something as it is. It is just fear. It has no root. It has no basis. A conditioned response to an immature or a maturing mind to the causality of everything and the existential propaganda of, of death. And it was quite illuminating to just feel and appreciate that there was in me. Maybe you have self-gratitude at times in honor of your own mindful presence and the associative qualities that arise with your commitment to seeing things as they are courage, patience, determination, truthfulness, I mean, self-respect, stature, this, the radiance of one's own knowing of your dignity, this, that purposeful presence that's engaging existence in self and other in the best way one knows how, that type of evolutional dignity. And there was a smile that began to emerge in my semi-unblindedness and my emerging wakefulness as I wrestled with wanting to sleep and not wanting to die and wanting to wake up and be free of the aneurysm, to be associated with my friends and my daughter. With light, with rainbows inside and outside. I get into these meditative places where I personally play with cognitive aesthetics through imagination and the more creative expressions of, of, of hope in action through playful imagination with possibilities of special encounters inside and outside. I kept thinking of really what, what is healing here? What is it that heart is, is aspiring for? What is it that you want to see and become unblinded from? And I go into this place, I don't know about you, but of feeling secure within the frailty of everything, feeling courageous and indomitable within the vulnerability, these dueling interrelated vines or serpents at times or strains of spiritually infused intelligence that animates one, my own decision-making process. I mean, what is, a, what is a thought from the most heightened trans-psychedelic insight possible to drop that intimately into that, that information river. 
life as consciousness, life as intelligence. And here we are meditating within all of this, occupying intelligence, occupying the intelligence of a liberating reality that's deeper than the fear of death. Right there is where I would say the word Dharma or Dhamma or meditation have a high radiant experience that that vocation is what I'm pointing to. Life is meditation, becoming unblinded. So much in the world today, especially in America, with the mainstream media becoming more alert to something that's been known now for well over a year, with the Chinese scientists, you may have been reading about it, seeing it in the news, that became infected with this strange pathogen, this virus known as COVID-19. Back in late 2019 in Wuhan and how it was concealed and shuttered and those who were aware at the time knew that there was this virus that had taken over this city. We knew nothing about Wuhan. I didn't. And it's in lockdown. A lockdown. What is a lockdown? This massive city is in lockdown. Yet the nuclear-powered genocidal dictator of China, Xi Jinping, the head of the Communist Chinese Party, not the, the 1.4 billion radically oppressed citizens of China. It's a very different grouping. Knowing well enough that there was a, a lethal virus in Wuhan, locking the city down, locking people into apartments, policing the streets, millions of people. Still, with that knowledge, with the lethality of that virus, people dying, still allowing international flights to leave China, with many people from the Wuhan province flying worldwide, including Canada, Australia, America, the EU, knowing that a lethal virus was, was, at, was loose. I mean, set aside where it came from, how deliberate or accidental it was in the Wuhan bioweapons lab, There's something so nefarious about that type of consciousness coming from the Communist Chinese Party to deliberately continue to spread the virus all the while trying to kill it and contain it in Wuhan. Meanwhile, receipts show that Xi Jinping and the Communist Chinese Party were buying up all forms of, of masks and suits and being shipped into China to, to have as many ways to protect their own people in the Wuhan area. And call it an oversight, but the world is in utter collapse today, economically and biologically, based upon that, that moment, that experience. And I bring it up because 
becoming unblinded and making life our meditation isn't just a personal journey of me being mindful of me. But here we are in this ecosystem of life. And today, I have never heard outside of the country of Myanmar or Burma, where I spent a large part of my adult life and studied the machinations and the psychology of totalitarianism and dictatorship, which is going on in full view of the world today, based upon the the terrorist organization occupying Myanmar, known as M-A-H-S-A-C, Ma Sak Ming Online, the former general of Burma's army, and S-A-C, the, the State Administration Council, of, uh, Burma's Khmer Rouge. We are what looks to be in an active in an active digital and information war occupation out of china with collusion and complicity with enterprises around the world wall street silicon valley davos to name just a few primarily the, the, the abscess of power and the preoccupation with privilege. We have a totalitarian wave that seems to be engulfing the world today. And I was sitting last night in my bed meditating and thinking about my aneurysm, the aneurysm, and the whole biological circuitry of the body and the narratives of discontinuity and what it meant to become unblinded from my own interiority and my own small circle of friends and family and to begin to become unblinded to the greater cultural, political, global scape, if you will, of, of something so life-threatening as what we're seeing in Burma today, but potentially seeing it happen worldwide. And I'm thinking, okay, now that gives me some sense of intensity and rigor and, and what's the word, the the existential, deep spiritual marrow that informs my ethical courage to want to pursue longevity in order to do what Aung San Suu Kyi has said so often and many of the people in her country, to foster in yourself your meditative ethos, the courage to care about a mindfulness not just of yourself. I was thinking about that last night, a mindfulness not just of yourself, but the courage to care about things larger than yourself. And I don't know about you, but as the news breaks more and more about the, the deep sociopathic involvement of Dr. Anthony Fauci in direct funding to people and institutions connected directly to the Wuhan bioweapons lab in China, and so many other forms of complicity, collusion, money transfers, where we don't even know, I don't know, I don't know about you, I don't even know how our own government has really much of a concern even for our own people anymore. It seems so obvious that there's a there's an, a growing diabolical cult, a global cult of one party domination. 
and I'm kind of reversing the role here of being the surgeon looking at the globe and saying there's a an aorta aneurysm called totalitarianism. I don't want to vilify my aorta, but analogously here, there's a greater threat to planetary survival. And so I'm interweaving these meditative narratives. The little things become interwoven and inseparable from the medium-sized things and the bigger things. And where does our meditation intersect with self-interest, cultural family interest, national interest, global interest, and transnational, transglobal. And what I mean by that is life unborn. It's been a recent concept over the last five years for me to even the last 10 years since I released A Future to Believe in, a book, my book, about the unborn, the concept of the unborn. And I'm inviting myself, you know, as I'm moving forward in my life with tremendous uncertainty, but equally roots in a highly cognizant determination of what's important to me. is, yes, 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 in that meditative state last night, where is their hope? I don't want to give up hope. What is hope and action? I kept asking myself. In, in your presence to see things as they are, in your becoming unblinded or undistorted, unvarnished, naked, willing to engage in the authenticity of a fact as it is, to understand your own roots in complicity and collusion, to not point the finger elsewhere, but to feel more intimately in one's own heart. What's really important? What's driving your meditation? Personal peace, personal happiness, personal survival, or deep interrelated purposefulness, if you will, high fidelity engagement to what? I want to see reality rightly. I want to engage distorting forms of contraband. I want to challenge the blindedness of totalitarianism and the violence that, that often is coupled with that level of a pathological domination. That my life as a dictator exceeds anything you could think of as democratic or a value with regard to your idea of free speech. My idea of my worth is far more powerful than democracy and the views of society. And I'm thinking, wow, wow, this is is really quite a meditation, I'm thinking, because it's coupled intimately with my friend and ally, mentor, shared teacher, Aung San Suu Kyi, the other elected leaders being paraded before the Orwellian military tribunal in Naypyidaw, the capital of Myanmar, by the terrorist leader, Ming Online. I don't know what the mockery of reality, the, the, the blindedness of this man's pathological certainty and how easy it is to, to applaud him. I mean, I'm thinking of like what it would be like to be in the room with Xi Jinping, Ming Online, 
and Putin and how they would relate with their wives and their family and, you know, a, a real executive pass into a party with these people of, say, 50. And what would be the conversations? What would be the energy? What would you do? What would you say? What would be your meditation there? And say, hypothetically, there was a, a toast that was to be given to Ming Online, our modern day Adolf Hitler. And everyone in the room was expected because you're an executive, a privileged executive in the totalitarian clique of the globe. And to say something to the terrorist leader, Ming Online. And I'm imagining meditatively in my dream last night, my anti dream of looking at my heart and the surreal nature of being diagnosed with this aneurysm and the their unequivocal certainty of surgery or death. What would I say? I know I would use the word becoming unblinded. What a gift it would be to have a, a section, a scene. Maybe I'll do a talk tomorrow my toast to Ming Online and all women and men who embody the totalitarian evil. <laughs> that we coexist on this planet. That four years, three years, two years, Ten years? Is it possible that Ottawa, Vancouver, Toronto, Paris, London, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles, Sydney, Melbourne, Bangkok, Jakarta, Saigon, all become totalitarian prison camps? under a one-party rule governed by all of those dictatorial oligarchs? Is that the future of planet Earth? In breath, I'm going out breath. You know, undergo surgery so you can live to see the horror of what's gone in Mandalay and in Rangoon today, where no place is safe on a street, on a balcony, or in a home. You could be shot, imprisoned, killed, raped, tortured, and it's happening as I speak. Is it possible for that to happen worldwide? I ask myself, what's more important than surgery? What's more important than, than even living or dying? What's your toast, transmeditative toast? And I think I would create a spontaneous poem prose, scream, rant, called unblinded, becoming unblinded, raw, naked, engaged, transdictorial, courageous dissolving of totalitarian structures inside and outside. Paint the earth with sacred love. Fill the reservoirs and the clouds with high degrees of transparent psilocybin. 
allow all the men armored with their fear of the divine and of intimacy to be caressed by invisible hands of goddesses inside and outside so that you weep in overcoming your distress of control through domination and torture. Rid the psyche in the universe of the proclivity of being so eyes wide open and blinded that you believe in evil. That's good. <laughs> what would be your hymn, your toast to Xi Jinping and to Putin, to Ming Online, to the great Satan everywhere running through the veins of all things? Who would you sing to? What would you say? In your meditation of the little things of becoming unblinded. And I'm sharing here as I come to an end the intimacies of simply how I meditate, how I mind my mind, mind my interiority, the free flowing of what I respect in myself my mindful dignity, my mindful courage, my ethical openness to integrate some light, some eyesight into my folds, into my vulnerabilities, into my fears. And I do have a deep hope of spending the next month or two, God willing, in healing the aorta. I will leave here shortly without surgery. It is not a death wish. It is not some indirect or overt desire to die or to commit a slow or a rapid suicide. It's to live in the fidelity of an open-heartedness and an honesty to the dignity of my last 70 years. I do not want to betray myself. I want to stay in utter clarity with the deepest sense of purpose to transform as much as humanly possible the primordial forces in my own humble way of my own fears and to treat the gift of existence, the horrors that I see all around the world. Yes, it's a sadness with this prognosis, but to dissolve that with eyesight, become unblinded and to live in the radiance of another breath, another day, another moment, another kiss, another hand held, another night, I want to say sleepless, but not sleepless, super engaged in the intimacy of feeling the truth of opening my heart, opening my eyes to the innate vulnerability of being. It can't be controlled on your terms of control. It can be seen and felt and understood and courageously engaged Hold on to me, as it's been said, and you will suffer. Demystifying the process and finding a more radiant experience of wonderment that transcends even the mystical. Reinventing the evolutional intelligence inherent in the word meditation. Dhamma is just a word for the evolutional transformational intelligence of Satipatthana. Mindfulness 
of inner beingness in connection to consciousness through the senses and context in this invenerating, endlessly causally arising phenomenology of life known as samsara. I wish to see it clearly, Ming Online. I invite you, sir, to open your mouth Place this substance called psychedelicized satipatthana molecule with a high dose of meta infused DMT, equally oxygenate your lungs with this artificially created hyper transparent vapor of MDMA. Together, sir, in the company of our fellow and sister dictators, that I have entered through disguise. I'm an undercover agent of freedom. My poem to you, sir, is this substance of transformation. And all of us in the room, may all of us breathe in simultaneous this elixir of liberation. And may the world dissolve its fear that gives rise to this primordial dinosauric need to control and dominate. Could you imagine that castle in Napidor with all those men and women? I infiltrated. Well, guess what? The membrane of existence is so transparent. Over there is right here. We breathe the same air. The cognitive interrelated transparency of the miraculous Dhamma. I want to know you, learn to love you. I want to know that Ibinya of radical transformation, that level of far reaching compassion if I can give a small morsel of food to someone to feed them, why can't we give an incredible cognitive wave of transformational love that overwhelms another being's fear and for one brief moment of eternity? Ah, the totalitarian gene is relaxed and all of a sudden Xi Jinping, Putin, Ming Online and the millions of other people around the world, including the heads of government, the United Nations, claws in Davos, weep, weep in the resurrection of love on this planet. Let's keep alive in our meditation wonderment free-flowing poetic hymns that do everything to reinvent the meaning of metta. Say it in a way that's so real, so unique, so original, that you do believe in the evolutional wisdom of your presence, in-breath, out-breath. I woke up in the morning remembering my meditation, remembering my dream of making love with this primordial goddess released into this erotic state of liberation where, as I close today, may this blessed planet of ours learn to make Life of meditation, becoming unblinded from the chaos of delusion and fear. May I invite you to invite me to invite as many friends to come join us together and to create something so special, so remarkable that even after we're forgotten, the boys and the girls will remember the way we live through the, the invisible, tangible, 
energies that exceed the body, that exceed surgery, that exceed health, that exceed the fear of dying and aging, that exceed all of those delusions. We keep alive this timeless Dhamma, these, this to me is the word for becoming unblinded and seeing life so that we can use our lives to, to give back. So from my heart to yours, thank you for the opportunity to share in this digital sharing of free flowing poetic prose meant to heal, to liberate. And I pray for the boys and girls for the earth. May this wave of totalitarianism and that energetic toxicity of collusion, may we take up whatever is required to not sit quietly. Let us hear the screams and the cries and the tears and the courage of the boys and girls all over the world, but equally in Burma today, who are fighting to get into that special party that I infiltrated briefly. May we join the forces and fight against the rise of what clearly looks to be this Fourth Reich. May we not stand idly by and be controlled through propaganda or apathy or the false faces of religion or politics or profit, all the ways in which we compromise the fidelity of what, say, the blessed Anne Frank gave us, the blessed Do Aung San Suu Kyi is giving us, the hundreds of thousands of others, unnamed courageous savants, cried, bleeding, tortured, to challenge dictatorship and to illuminate freedom. So let us all do everything to become unblinded and to, to radiate our souls, our lives with the light of freedom. I think if we do that sufficiently enough, my belief is that freedom will never die, both in our country, in our hearts, in the world, and I pray in this vast samsara that we're embedded. So from my heart to yours, thank you for being here. Thank you for being in my life. And I hope to see you tomorrow.